I know this will shock many of you, but the last video triggered a deluge of complaints about the lack of nearly action and content free time lapses. Here then is an immediate humble offering. Right, back to business discerning viewers. We're sorting out the mask today with all the extraordinary attention to detail and extravagant artistry that entails. Firstly, I had to sort out the cables sprouting from the bottom of the mast, as given five minutes unsupervised, they immediately tangle into a jumble. I don't want the wires and cables to run down inside the mast unsheathed, mainly because there are bolts, rivets and other things inside I don't want them to be caught on or abraded by. I already had a few lengths of plastic pipe, but once the length of one is corrected by way of an in no way over the top deployment of the angle grinder, clearly the ends will still be sharp. A cable could come to grief, especially with thousands of repeated small movements through the mast's life, so I'm using the all-weather version of Gorilla Tape to soften those cut ends. Much better. These wires and cables really do specialise in a form of tangling I can't quite fathom. Seemingly just picking them up and putting them back down again is enough. But I have lots of practice from my days untangling sled dog lines, so I got it done, and the final pair of foghorn wires are now in place. Where the mast meets the spar needs some more attention, so I'm grouping together a few proximate cables and silicon wrapping them, with a twist of stainless wire to secure. I may overwrap these again, but you get the picture. I've sneakily slid the wind turbine into place, as of course its pair of wires needed to be included. When using the turbine in the Arctic, where weight really, really matters, I've made a slightly enlarged but much lighter carbon fibre tail. It replaces the steel one that comes from the factory, but needs to be drilled carefully and screwed into place. I'm using Nord locks to make sure that the vibrations don't eventually loosen the bolts and fling my cutting edge creation into the sea. The turbine spins freely as it should, and this is the smaller version, as I felt Rutland's 914 turbine would be overkill on this mast. The foghorn is going on sideways, so I've sealed, filled, smoothed and primed the new upper half to discourage water from getting in. The vents remain at the bottom, and I've drilled a couple more drainage holes. Finally, I use sealant and a peel rivet to secure the mount in place. This is something of a compromise. The mount is aluminium, but the mast is steel. There's galvanic mischief possible, but I can coat the aluminium liberally in paint, and it's easier to drill out later if it needs removing. And yes, I will finish the paint job post haste. I wanted a few jobs to do with the orange paint before opening the tin. Comment section worries may still share my desire to protect, perhaps overprotect, the cables for the short sections of their journey outside the sanctuary of the mast or the span. So I did a quick boatyard survey to see what others had done. People seem fairly relaxed about bare cables, and this chap takes a very anything goes approach. I'll stick with my cautious over wrapping plan, I think. The mast must now rise and take its rightful place. I really did not pick a good moment. It's been stubbornly windy at the yard for weeks now, or at least every time I'm there, and it's limited how much external paint and glassing work I can do. And now it threatens to knock me the three or four metres down off Allen and back to where I belong. The mast isn't that heavy and doesn't catch the wind like a sail, but it's an awkward climb and I needed to avoid stepping on the tail of cables or bashing the antennas on things. First, I fed the cables down the hole in the centre of the collar mount and made sure they dropped down without tangles or snags. Then I pushed the base of the mast, which has a rubber edging to limit friction or slicing action, onto the collar. I pushed the solid braces two large bolts into place, and only then realised I'd forgotten one important task. That was to tie back the turbine blades. There's no load, so I had to sort this out quickly or I could risk burning out the turbine. But not before putting in one and then two temporary guy lines of mooring rope. Until then, only the brace was keeping all in place. The wind really did not help. Now it's up, I've taken the measurements for the permanent metal rope and tensioner assembly so they can be made up by professional riggers for me. There'll be four, two heading fore and aft, and two to keep the span still. There's a little bit of a lean on the mast, but that's just down to how I tighten the ropes, and can be easily corrected once the wires arrive. I checked, and the brace is definitely straight, and so I was confident enough to properly place and torque the nylock nuts onto the brace. People will remember that the bolt heads inside the mast are held in place onto their custom washer with JB Weld, and this held strong as the nuts clamped tight. I'll just let you have a look at it now. A long time and many episodes and snippets in the making, I know. 
It's as slim line as I wanted, large enough for its roll, but not too large or a hazard to high winds, and I can just about reach the top of the turbine without a ladder. Fear not, these ropes will be gone soon and replaced with rigging. Oh, and the mast will actually end up upright, and we can hope that all the electrics work first time, once connected down below. I'll leave you with a view of the emptyish creek. This will be Alan's route to the open sea in a few weeks' time. Alan and I are counting on your continued devotion and unwavering constructive positivity. Bye.